would you mind taking a sure. chair? And since, since you invoked uh, Lawrence Krauss, um, perhaps we'll bring him up. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things while you come ahead, Lawrence. It's fine. Um, Lawrence Krauss is the uh, director of the Center of Education, and Research, and Cosmology and Astrophysics at Case Western Rest Reserve University, and uh, has done a lot of communication of science. I just wanted to make a couple of points there. We'll get on to the, some of the religion stuff later. And the Islamic point, uh, Steve, that we, we, we actually emailed on this, the whole notion of al-Ghazali, um, who in some sense was responsible for the spread of fund fundamentalism in Islam, was in fact a Sufi. And there is now a great call uh, in the Islamic community, as I read it, um, to, to, to point out that it's not just some monolithic faith, that in fact there's, there's huge numbers of sects. And that what is required is for these various sects to go back to their original roots and start expressing themselves away again and getting away from the, just the extreme fundamentalist position that's now taken, taken control of it. And uh, there was a column in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago by Nicholas Kristof in which he said that what was perhaps was required at this point, um, and I'm not endorsing this or for or against, but he said that perhaps what we needed was a kind of an Islam, uh, Islamic reformation and uh, a Muslim Luther which is an interesting concept. It's something for you to think about, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but in the interim... Uh, but I should say that <laughs> Al-Ghazali was a, was a philosopher before he was a Sufi. He was a right. student of Greek philosophy, and then he became a Sufi. And he really uh, followed very much the same career path as Augustine, who was also uh, enamored of Greek philosophy and then turned his back on it. Great. Thank you. But the Christianity recovered from that, and Islam hasn't. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's hear um, Lawrence Krauss. Okay, good. When, when Roger asked me last night to uh, speak after Steve, I knew I wouldn't be able to compete in, in, in ideas, so I decided I'd, I'd, I'd have pictures. Um, the, uh, I wasn't quite sure what Steve would talk about, but I do want to talk about the, the conflict between science and religion and argue that, um, that by, by focusing on... Um, the, this conflict that scientists uh, not only demean religion, which I think is the intent of a number of them, but demean science. Um, so let me let me argue that that we are in fact that Steve gave a wonderful history of the of the conflict of of science and religion, but it isn't all ancient history, and there's lots of recent examples. This was an example in 2001 in in uh, Afghanistan back when the Taliban were sort of our allies. Um, this is really uh, uh, this is a yeah, conflict between archaeology and religion. This is the fam one of the famous yeah. Buddhas, uh, which, um, which the Taliban destroyed, a beautiful, incredible, almost 2,000-year-old uh, 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 statues of incredible importance to civilization. And, but their religious belief at the time suggested that no likenesses of human beings should be uh, portrayed. So they wanted to destroy all statues in Afghanistan. They didn't manage to do that, but unfortunately, they did manage to destroy that. At the same time, in this country, uh, there were conflicts, and this is one of my favorites. This was Tom DeLay from your state, Steve, who, who, uh, who uh, in fact, uh, um, has a degree in biology, which always amazes me, um, who put into the congressional record that the Columbine school shootings occurred in part, quote, unquote, because our school systems teach our children that they're nothing but glorified apes who have evolutionized out of some primordial mud. Okay, this is the well, then uh, House Majority Leader. This is a clear conflict uh, between science and religion. And it is, uh, it is not theoretical in any way. It's very real. And I, unfortunately, have to waste a lot of my time on this very real conflict that's happening nowadays. And uh, it's been my, here, here's some literature uh, that, uh, by groups who, who have been against evolution. Was it? Yeah, this is a pointer. Great, thanks. Um, so this is quite clear, right? Uh, and, and they're quite straightforward about it. In fact, I think Steve would, would, would argue that indeed this is, I don't know whether he'd argue that he's motivated by Satan so much, but, but, or the sciences, but, but uh, that in fact that, so, that evolution as part of science should aim at the bedrock of, of, uh, of Christianity. And you see here that, that the point is that evolution is responsible at, 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 in this picture for all of the sins of humanity, everything from awful humanism to divorce, euthanasia, homosexuality, pornography, abortion, racism, etc. And this really, for me, represents the, the problem of focusing on the conflict. Uh, because I, I view why I, as a physicist, have gotten involved in this is, is kind of interesting. I, I view evolution as a straw man. 
it's really, this conflict that you see here is really based on a fear of science. A fear that, that's, in fact, Steve has argued in some sense is a real fear. Okay, so it's working. I got it working. But a fear that because science, in principle, not only replaces, potentially can replace God, but more importantly, I think, a fear of the fact that science doesn't explicitly mention God must mean, therefore, that science is immoral at its basis. And therefore, because it's immoral, it must be wrong. So because science doesn't explicitly include God, it, is therefore, it must therefore be wrong. And it's an a priori argument. And therefore, we have to change the way science is done. And evolution is just one example. The real goal in Kansas and other places in Ohio and, and in your state very soon, I guarantee you, because this is a well-funded effort, is to change the teaching of science itself. That science, which, which attempts to explain natural phenomena by natural natural effects by natural causes, is itself intrinsically wrong. That God has to be an explicit part of the equation. Now, if I, let me talk about science enriching faith and quote one of my heroes. Um, so Steve has said a number of things I like about science religion, but this is particularly important, I think. That science does not make it impossible to believe in God. It just makes it possible to not believe in God. And that's really important. Because as he indicated, without science, everything is a special act. Nothing has any, everything is a miracle. When you have science, you suddenly can, can explain things based on, on, on natural causes. But it's the first sentence, I think, that's very important. And that, I think, is what we have to recognize. And where I will disagree strongly with several people, with Richard who will, Dawkins who will speak later, I think that, in fact, science does not make it impossible to believe in God, and we should recognize that fact and live with it. And in fact, stop being so pompous about it. That, that for better or worse, science itself, the existence of science itself, cannot disprove the existence of God. But science itself can provide a paradigm and a prototype for understanding the world and dealing with problems of humanity that might. And the, the, the key example that I want to give is actually one I used from a New York Times piece I wrote, which actually caused Cardinal Schoenborn to get so upset that he wrote in response, which amazed me, because this was a piece where I argued that the Catholic Church was OK with evolution. And um, he got offended by that statement. Uh, but the example actually wasn't from, from evolution. It was from cosmology. And, and, and it involved Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest, who was the first, one of the first people to actually understand that Einstein's general relativity predicted a Big Bang. Einstein didn't. Einstein thought the universe was static and eternal. And he derided, in fact, Lemaitre, as he did in many cases, people who disagreed with him early on, the good aspect is that he eventually realized Lemaitre was right. But so when Lemaitre pointed this out, that, that, that one of the predictions of, of general relativity was that there was a beginning of the universe, Pope Pius at the time got very excited and, and wrote a public statement saying science had proved Genesis. OK? Now, what did Lemaitre do? He's a, he was a priest at the time, and, OK, and always was. He wrote to the Pope and said, stop saying that. <laughs> okay? And he said, you have no right to say that. You, you can take this, if you wish, to mean that science has, has, has proved Genesis to be correct. But you can also take it, this is a scientific theory. And it can be tested. And it stands on its own as science. What you take from it depends upon your metaphysical or religious background. You can take from it to be that it proves Genesis. Or you can take from it to be that you don't need God at all, that the laws of physics will describe the universe right back to the beginning. What you take from it is your personal belief. And the science is independent of that belief. And I think that's very important, because the Big Bang is true whether or not you believe in God. Evolution happened whether or not you believe in God. And I think that what we should focus on, in fact, is ways that science can, in fact, if you wish, enrich faith by moving us, for some of us who are not people of faith, and I'm not, by moving us beyond faith that science can be used as an example of how to understand the world in a good way, in a positive way, instead of a negative way. That, we should, that science teaches us to oppose blind, unquestioning belief. As, as Steve said, there are no scientific authorities. There are scientific experts, but no scientific authorities. It can inform faith in lots of ways. In particular, we, it's very important that we don't respect all religious sensibilities. I think we need to respect people's, respect people's philosophical notions in general, unless those notions are wrong. And what I mean by, and the great thing about science is that it, there's some things that are wrong. In fact, that's what makes science unique. 
unambiguously, we can say what's wrong. We can't say what's right unambiguously, but we can say what's wrong unambiguously. And that's why we make progress. The Earth isn't 6,000 years old. It's wrong. If you have to believe that to believe in God, you better re-examine your belief in God. The sun didn't stand still in the sky in the Old Testament, but we can use it in other areas. I, 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 gave, I actually presented a slide at a meeting of a bunch of very faithful people where it's kind of weird that I'm here for balance because at that meeting I guess I was viewed as an extremist. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the, the uh, you know, where I said homosexuality is not an abomination. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I can say science can inform religion in two ways. First of all, that homosexuality occurs naturally in various species. So it's certainly not an abomination in nature. But more importantly, science can say, well, if you believe that because of the fact that you're literally reading from the Old Testament, then you have to. You, it's, it's all or nothing. Then you have to accept the fact that you're allowed to kill your children if they disobey with you, disobey you or, 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 or sell your wife into slavery if she's not politically appropriate or whatever. In fact, you, uh, you have to say that, that, we, that, that women are not subservient chattel, as is the case in the Old Testament and in many religious documents. And if not to just offend Judeo-Christian religious sensibilities, the Kennewick man was not a Numatilla Indian. Okay? And, and it was an offense to me when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers held on to that skeleton. If you don't know, this was a 9,000-year-old skeleton that was discovered in the Columbia River on, uh, in, uh, uh, on Umatilla Indian land. And it was interesting because it was claimed that this skeleton had Caucasian features. In fact, if you put skin on him, he'd look somewhat like uh, Patrick Stewart. But, um, uh, and it was a fascinating it's a question, but, we, but for many years, scientists weren't allowed to study the skeleton because the Umatilla Indians said, this is on our land, and therefore it's one of our ancestors, and we believe the Earth is 5,000 years old, and this is 9,000 years old, and, and we want to want to keep this for ourselves. And it's just ludicrous, in fact. And this, this, the Kennewick man had as much genetic uh, relationship to an Umatilla Indian as they, as they did to me, and it's ridiculous to respect those kind of nonsensical sensibilities. And we have to emphasize that these documents are historical documents. So we can enrich faith by pointing out uh, what's nonsense. But in particular, I, I spend a lot of time talking to scientists about teaching. And, and this, I believe, is, is the biggest mistake that any teacher can make, <laughs> which is to assume they're interested, the students are interested in what they have to say. It sounds trite, but it's absolutely true. You have to sell. Teaching is selling. And science is selling. And, and, and it's, in fact, it's seduction. If you want to educate people, you have to go to where they are and reach out to where they're coming from. And if you want to educate people, attacking them is not going to educate them at all. And I think most of us here, or I think Steve and I would certainly agree that what we want to do is educate. We want to explain to people the wonders of nature. But if we want to make them receptive to it, we have to understand where they're coming from. In fact, this, I decided to quote someone else. In this case, I quoted myself. I, this was a, a review of mine for, of Richard Dawkins' book that, uh, that just came out, that my review just came out in Nature. And I, and I think that's true. I think that, we could, that the strategy of focusing on telling people who didn't, what not to believe is less compelling than positively demonstrating how the wonders of nature can suggest a world without God that is nevertheless both complete and wonderful. If, we, if, if, you, if you believe that and want to convince people of that, Focus on what is so incredible and marvelous and fantastic about the universe and, don't, and, and not on what, what, what people shouldn't believe in. And in fact, in this sense, I think scientists have responsibility. And scientists and physicists are the worst. I think we're the most obnoxious of the bunch, potentially. But uh, uh, because we, well, anyway. Um, no, biologists. I, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. But uh, science has been so successful, I think scientists, not, many scientists act like, we know what's good for you, and we're going to explain what's good for you. And that approach, that approach immediately turns people off, and in fact is, in my mind, responsible for a lot of the public reaction against science. 